So I'm going to present shortly um, the house <laughs> rules and our team. Um, so, and the topic, of course. Um, today we have our member VoxelJet America present. Um, they will be talking about uh, additive manufacturing and 3D printing um, and what kind of trends we see in the industry. Um, but also shortly, I would like to take the opportunity to introduce uh, our team uh, for membership engagement and events. So recently we had Robert join our team. Uh, he's the manager for membership engagement uh, based in Chicago. So he'll be closer to our Chicago members. Um, then of course, Mario, who is our vice president, who you all know. And then Franzi in the background is our events and membership manager. And I myself am also the membership engagement manager uh, at the Detroit office. I'm always happy to help for anything related to your membership. Um, some guidance for the business luncheon and some uh, housekeeping rules. Um, you will be muted during the presentation itself. However, you can unmute yourself during the Q&A session to ask your questions. Um, you can share your questions and comments through the chat by sending it to everyone. I'm more than happy to pick that up and ask it to our presenter. And on the top right of your screen, you can switch between speaker view and gallery, gallery view according to your preferences. And if you're having any technical difficulties, then just ask GACC Midwest for help and we'll be more than happy to help. We'll also send you an uh, a survey after the presentation. Um, today's sponsor is Rödel and Partner. Uh, thank you very much for the sponsorship. Without you, this would not be possible. Um, Pierre Kriel uh, is here from Rödel and Partner and um, he will be saying a few words and also introduce our speaker. Yeah, thank you, Jules. Um, yes, so just a very shortly for myself, um, you know, we as Rudel and Partner, um, you know, we're very proud to be associated um, with and also sponsoring um, the Michigan Business Luncheon Series. Um, myself, my name is uh, Pierre Creel. I'm the partner in charge of our office um, here in Southfield in the Detroit metro area. Um, you know, as Jules was saying, um, you know, we really look forward to, to learning more about 3D printing and additive manufacturing. And um, we've got no one better to, to tell us about that. And we'd like to hand it over now to uh, Michael Doherty from uh, VoxelJet America um, for today's presentation. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Pierre. So hello, everybody. Uh, I guess we got the intros down there a minute ago, but uh, um, so I've, I've been with VoxelJet uh, just about three years now, so I've uh, got to learn a lot in the last few years. Uh, so uh, I may not know everything if you ask uh, 3D printing questions, maybe not even about VoxelJet, but I will figure it out if I don't. But uh, definitely have been uh, immersed pretty heavily for three years now. So I don't know how much anybody on here has been involved in the manufacturing side or additive manufacturing side. But um, if, you, uh, if you have and I say something wrong, feel free to correct me. But uh, I think, I think we'll, uh, we'll kind of cover where we think we are. Uh, just as this slide indicates, this is more of an investor presentation, but I think it's a good overview of the company. Uh, I'm not going to go through uh, detail by detail here on it. I thought I would more talk about what's going on and, uh, and then open to any questions anybody has or anything like that. So. I'll go ahead and get started. Kind of an overview of the, of the market. Uh, so additive manufacturing is a, or 3D printing is a huge, obviously buzzword in industry. Uh, companies are figuring it out, uh, which is really good for, for guys like me that are trying to sell it. Um, and uh, they're figuring it out in a lot of ways. Uh, it's, it's, we're getting better at what we do in printing. Um, and customers are getting better at understanding what it is and how to apply it and what it allows them to do. So I'll kind of talk through those as we go here a little bit throughout the presentation, but there's really uh, a lot of transition happening at the moment. Um, you know, the flexibility and freedom that you have by printing uh, is, a, is just a, a world of difference compared to traditional ways. Uh, speed to market is uh, probably one of the biggest topics that a lot of like automotive companies deal with. 
you know, the additive side really contributes to that and allows that to be shortened considerably. Um, it's new markets, uh, new markets are coming for it. Old markets are coming in. Um, so it's, it's really a blend. It's, it's kind of a, a good time to be in 3D printing is where I think we're at. Um, so it, it's, it's a fun time. Uh, some of these areas uh, like bioprinting, surgical guides, uh, even prosthetics, uh, VoxelJet doesn't do uh, specifically. Um, I'm gonna try to keep this not as too much of a VoxelJet commercial, uh, but it is, uh, it is a lot of what we do. But uh, the printing side for the medical industry um, is, is really opening doors. Uh, they're starting to essentially 3D print um, uh, like valves for hearts, uh, different things they're doing. So um, there's a lot of things that are being done in the medical side that are really gonna, I think, revolutionize that side. Again, I'm not an expert in that area. Uh, we don't really do that side of things. We're more of an industrial uh, printer from our side. Um, so, it, so it's a little different approach, but, uh, but it's, it's a definitely an interesting market that I think is going to be, we're going to hear a lot out of in the future. Um, so uh, just a little bit on, on VoxelJet and really it's, it's VoxelJet, but it is the industry. Um, so these two items, material diversity and speed are really opening up areas for 3D printing uh, where we couldn't work before because we just weren't printing fast enough for volumes or we couldn't print the right material that was needed or wanted for applications. Um, the advancements there are, are literally uh, weekly almost uh, of what's coming out new on speed and materials. So it just continues to expand and open new areas to apply the technology. Size is kind of a voxel jet thing. We're known for having very large printers. Uh, what that does is that opens it up to, um, like an automotive company can now print an entire front fascia for a car in one piece. So early on in their processes, they can print an entire piece, fit it up, see what it looks like, uh, tweak designs before they even thought about making a tool to make millions of something down the road. So the size side is kind of our specialty. That's what we do, but the material and speed, the entire industry is really, uh, really pushing that, uh, that forward. Um, we have two great guys that run the company. That's probably more for the investors uh, side of things. So I won't spend much time there, but they're both uh, 20 years in the industry. Our CEO uh, was the inventor of the technology that we use, uh, which is a fun thing because that means the technology is a key part of our business, uh, which, is, uh, which is always good because we're always pushing envelopes to do a little more and a little better. And I think most printing companies, 3D printer companies are, are doing exactly that. A little bit of background on us. Um, so we have a couple hundred printers installed. Uh, we, we are a tech company, even though we're making industrial machines and printers. Uh, you know, we spend about 30% of our, um, our revenue on R&D. Uh, so we're, we're definitely pumping uh, a lot of technology out and working through a lot of things. 420 patents. Uh, the capacity to print doesn't mean a whole lot to a lot of people, but uh, uh, basically we have more capacity than, um, than demand for printers, and we're keeping it that way because our printers are getting faster and faster, uh, so it's working out. Been around a little over 20 years, five locations worldwide, 250 people globally, um, just went on the NASDAQ, I'm right here clapping. You can see on the board uh, when our CEO was in ringing the bell for when we went on the NASDAQ last summer. Um, this was a, a great move for us. We were on the New York Stock Exchange for, uh, for uh, six years and uh, the NASDAQ is a much better fit. It's a little more tech friendly. Um, so they appreciate what we do a little more with that 30% in the R&D side. Um, that, uh, that the New York Stock Exchange didn't necessarily uh, appreciate as much. So it's been a much better fit for us. It's working out uh, quite well. Uh, the stock's doing well um, uh, since we made that move. So it's been good for us. Uh, let's see, okay, a little bit on the process. So additive manufacturing can be done a lot of ways. Uh, you can uh, squeeze uh, plastic out and build layers up. You can uh, uh, melt metal and lay it on top of each other. 
The, uh, the method we used is called powder bed binder jet printing. Um, so what we do is we let a full bed of powder out, and then we run a print head over it uh, that just sprays the binding material wherever the parts are in that bed of, bed of powder. We lower it down, we do another layer, run the print head over and print wherever those parts are. The advantage of that is it's, uh, it's a fast process. You can get an entire layer of parts in one shot as you're going through uh, and you can scale it. So that's what the size uh, discussion was a little bit ago. And I'll show you the different printer sizes that we have that are all basically the same process. We're not the only guys doing that. We are the only guys going as big as we are, but uh, everybody has a small version that they usually develop and learn on and then apply it to the bigger ones. It scales quite easily. This technology scales uh, really well that we do. Um, let's see, we do have three manufacturing locations. Um, uh, Germany, which is a, a, a kind of the hub of additive manufacturing. It's interesting. Uh, a lot of it is taken off there, including the material development, which is really good and key to, uh, to the success and, and growth moving forward. Uh, we're headquartered near Munich. Uh, here in the US, we're near Detroit. Uh, this is our facility. And then we have a new facility we just opened in China uh, two years ago. Um, to, get, uh, to get China underway. Um, all of the R&D work for us is done in Germany. Uh, we do sales and operations here. China does sales and operations also. Um, so yeah, it's a, the technical side is still all done out of Germany, um, which works pretty good because they're usually pretty smart guys there. So it's, uh, it's good for us. A little spread on the revenue, it's not terribly relevant or even meaningful, but uh, uh, Asia is the growing market for us. It's the biggest target to grow in. Um, so that's why we built the new facility to grow that up and develop it. The US side, uh, we've been here for six years now. Um, we have been restricted for selling about half of our products in the US due to patents. Um, so the, the numbers are down, that restriction's going away. So we're gonna start growing. And if I, if I do a good job, we'll, we'll surpass our uh, European friends there in the, in the revenue numbers. So that's the, uh, that's the objective here, but uh, definitely global, definitely spread around and additive is gonna be that way uh, for sure everywhere. So it's been, additive has been around a long time. 3D printing is a huge, buzzword now and in the past maybe five, ten, five to eight years, it's become more and more of a buzzword. But really uh, the starting of our company, we were working with uh, pretty significant companies that were applying the technology. Um, the, the key there is they were applying it in very limited applications initially, and then they learned how to apply it and what it could do for them and have applied it more and more and more. And uh, I'll talk later, but uh, uh, I guess I have to say a European automotive manufacturer uh, is applying the technology um, very uniquely and really going to, uh, to uh, upset the market with, with what they're doing. So I'll, I'll cover that a little more in a minute. Just talking about that size thing a little bit. So this is our little printer. Um, we don't do the desktop printers. You know, a lot of folks have the, they're called FDM printers where they squirt plastic out on build up layers. Those are cool little printers. They have a purpose for sure, um, but uh, that's not what we're interested in. We're interested in going into a factory and automating the factory with printing. That's what we are uh, doing. And we think that's where the real opportunity is to change and disrupt the industry. Um, so that's where we're at. So we have a little printer here. It, that, it's a good size printer. It prints about a shoebox. Um, it's mostly used for developing material and processes to learn how to run a different material if it requires heat or doesn't require heat in the different settings that it needs. Um, so we work through that. Then we get up to our bigger printers, our 1000s, kind of our workhorse. There's the most of those out there of any. 2000s moving up to the large, uh, uh, more production type printer. Our 4000 is uh, uh, the largest sand printing machine in the world. Uh, it's actually a room of its own. 
Uh, we have a couple running in the US right now and hopefully a couple more before too long. Again, if I do my job well, but uh, we have uh, a couple of them running in the Detroit area, one of them at our facility. And this printer can print a four meter by two meter by one meter print in one piece. Um, so it's a pretty unique, uh, unique offering that, uh, that nobody else offers and really can apply extremely well um, in, in certain applications. So it's one of the things we do. Um, I mentioned there we're printing stand on that printer and uh, the roots of our company are supporting the foundry industry, uh, which is an interesting thing because printing is a direct opposite of the foundry work of pouring castings. Um, so we have been supporting them forever, uh, well, for 20 years. Um, and we actually print the mold or the core that is used for the casting process. So if you have a, a large transfer housing on a, on a mining truck or something that's huge, we can print a single mold and core to pour that in one piece off this printer. Um, it's a very unique thing that's being applied more and more. And then one of the most exciting things that I'll talk about a little more in depth here is the VJet X. So this is really targeting volume production, the automotive industry, and, uh, and really doing things differently. Um, so just to give you a range, the, these printers, anywhere from a shoebox up to four meter by two meter by one meter print is, uh, is kind of where we're playing. So a little bit more on these next generation. So these two printers we're showing here are really an indication of what the industry is doing. Um, VJet X, this, this one is printing forecasting still, but it, and that's indirect metal parts. That's, that's what that's referring to. Um, but this is stepping up to where um, it's, we're gonna have a cell of these printers running automated uh, that'll make about a half a million a year out of the cell. So you're starting to talk about, you put a couple cells in, you can start to move automotive volumes uh, with 3D printing, which has really never been done. It's always injection molding, traditional tooling, all the fast uh, ways of doing it. We're now getting there and, and with all the freedoms of 3D printing. Um, the HSS, so this is the uh, planet printing a finished plastic piece. Um, this is opening up so for speed, so we can make hundreds of small pieces in one run, or we can make one large piece in one run. And we have um, primarily automotive customers there very interested in, this, in both of those, a bunch of small ones or one big one. Um, for the flexibility that they get that they just haven't been able to have before uh, with these printers. And that's industries heading that way. We're getting faster, we're getting bigger, and we're getting cheaper um, to really compete with traditional methods um, and offer the flexibility that you have along with, uh, along with um, the, uh, those improvements that we're already doing. Uh, I don't. I don't think I need to go too much into these details, but uh, you know, really, it's less waste, higher recyclability, new markets. We are doing uh, soles for shoes. We're printing shoes for sole, uh, soles for shoes, which is an interesting thing, um, and that opens up to different areas. You can have people who want to make custom shoes for every foot that they go on, or you can make custom prints for a particular shoe model. Uh, which is a, a pretty interesting application. So probably the biggest sporting uh, equipment company in the world has one of our printers in their labs working on how they're going to use that exact thing. So it's a, it's a pretty interesting area that uh, I think initially 3D printing people weren't necessarily thinking of um, when, when we started 3D printers, but uh, it's printing a soft foam um, it's, it's a pretty interesting application for us. And believe it or not, one of the early adapters to this new finished plastic process was the shoe industry, um, which is an interesting thing. Cause again, I don't think any of us were thinking that when we came out with 3d printing to print shoes, I would say off our website inquiries, probably 15% at least are from shoe designers wanting to know if I can print a different type shoe for them. So it's an interesting application. Uh, so this one, uh, I think I've talked about most of this. It, it's all about speed 
and material. And we uh, have advancements in both. The whole industry is advancing in both um, to do exactly that. This is the car manufacturer I was talking about. So when they cast a cylinder head, they have what's called a water jacket core, which is the pocket inside the cylinder head where all the coolant goes to keep everything cool that needs to be cool as the engine's running. I don't know if anybody's engine people or not, but uh, uh, it's a pretty, pretty simple uh, item. Uh, because they were able to get rid of all the design restrictions that a traditional method of manufacturing castings gives them, they were able to route cooling to the exact places they wanted it inside the cylinder head because we're printing it and they're not making a tool to make it. They told us that that freedom of design with the same exact size cylinder head, just change in routing inside it, uh, gave them a 20% efficiency improvement out of that engine. Um, now, 20% in an engine, you know, you can use that for power, you can use it for fuel economy, emissions, you can apply that gain wherever it makes sense um, for what you're trying to do. But 20% without changing the size of the engine to be larger or anything is pretty incredible. Um, so when they uh, did that testing and figured that out, they move forward pretty quickly with their first cell of production. And this is a production run of 3D printed cores for their cylinder heads now. So you can see there's five machines lined up here. It's all automated. So it unloads out of the printer. It gets, uh, goes through an oven, goes through a cleaning station. A robot picks the parts up, sets it over for them to use. So it's fully automated. Um, operators aren't involved. And again, that cell is going to make about 500,000 a year. Um, so they're going to likely put three cells in and get full production out of 3D printing. So that is a major breakthrough in the 3D printing world to get to a production mode with a major automotive uh, production line. So this is uh, this is really exciting news uh, for the 3D printing world in general. And of course, VoxelJet being the guys there is, uh, is obviously real exciting for us, but, uh, but it really does change the game. And later on, I'm gonna show the additive world and what it's expected to grow to. And it's things like this that are creating that growth that we're seeing um, that's going on. Another area, so, uh, a lot of the foundry industry was is very worried that as internal combustion engines go away and you go to electric motors, the foundry business is going to really go down. And that may or may not be the case. I'm not honestly sure where that's going to go from the foundry side. We know there's a lot of components in an engine that are cast. And with electric cars, you probably have a lot of those go away. From our side, from the printing side, for the castings that do remain, we're actually seeing opportunity. Um, so, you know, one of the challenges in electric motors is heat. Uh, you're dealing with a lot of heat to maintain smaller motors with high power. You have to be able to keep them cool. Um, so because we're able to print the molds that these are cast with, you can see these small passages flow coolant wherever the engineers want. There's zero restrictions from a, a manufacturability standpoint, essentially. Um, these guys were able to get the time for reducing temperature from 60 to 40, which is a key uh, temperature drop. They reduced it by 70%, again, without changing size, just with changing the routing of the cooling. So as more and more uh, applications realize these opportunities and what they can do, along with that, us getting faster and smarter and better materials, um, we, we see huge opportunity uh, to apply printing throughout uh, really many industries, but you know, automotive is the volume. So it's an, always an interesting uh, one to talk about there. Um, so yeah, so this is, uh, this is a key example of what, um, what is enabled through 3D printing uh, that, that is not there uh, without it. Basically, you didn't have this as an option to form these cooling channels the way they are. It was basically impossible to make that um, the way it is. You can't drill them, obviously, because they're all crooked and bent. Um, so it's, it's a pretty unique thing. 
So on that market side, what that's going to do to our market. So that's going to, uh, we're expecting, well, actually we aren't. This is by, uh, what is this, Wohler's, I think is one of the trade or manufacturing experts of what's going to go on uh, in the future, talking about the transition over to more additive. Um, additive will never be everything made for sure, except for maybe on Mars with, uh, with Elon there. I guess everything there will be additive because that'll make sense. But, um, but here, there's always going to be a, a, um, a piece that makes sense to keep traditionally. If it's a simple tool, you don't have any tricky designs, you make a tool and you just make them the way we have forever because it's cheap. Um, when it gets complex or you want to take advantage of a freedom of design that isn't necessarily there today, um, you know, that's where the, uh, that's where the opportunity comes in for this growth. So, you know, going from 12 billion to 640 billion, uh, becoming additive manufacturing out of this $13 trillion manufacturing market, um, is, uh, is a pretty exciting thing for us small additive manufacturing guys in the, in the growth that can come with that. And that's driven again through those examples of the automotive guys figuring out uh, what the freedoms allow them to do in their designs and why it makes sense to do that. And then us being able to supply the volumes they need. So, you know, is this gonna happen in 2029 you know, or, or uh, 2032? Hard to say, but uh, for sure the trend is going that way where we're seeing significant growth um, for the additive opportunities industry in general. Um, and again, uh, electric vehicles was at one point looked to be a worry uh, for the foundry industry. Uh, from our perspective, it looks to be a positive, uh, which is kind of nice. Um, doing all the new things with the energy markets uh, all of that lends itself very well to printing uh, and flexibility. The volumes are not millions a year. So you may not want to do the traditional uh, production approach. Um, so it just fits printing really well. And then lightweight. So uh, there are, I don't even know how many parts, you know, on, on Elon's uh, rocket, the Falcon 9 that, that uh, launches. Uh, that are additive manufacturing, made through additive manufacturing. Um, we supply several of those. Uh, the grid fins that you see when the rocket lands back on the ground, there's grid fins that pop out to stabilize it. Uh, we make that with the foundry uh, for them. That's a printed pattern that is then cast later. Um, they couldn't make it without it. They were trying to weld and do everything else, could not do it. Um, we worked with one of their really good foundries, figured out a method to do that, and we're now making those uh, grid fins in, uh, in titanium, which is the trick of all of it because it can handle the heat. Uh, but it, again, it's a, it's a process that wasn't possible without being able to 3D print that model that, uh, that's there. So more and more of those applications uh, are happening. We're flying all over space for sure. Um, the art world uh, allows freedoms. You know, they used to have uh, uh, hand crafters uh, making uh, plaster molds to do statues and things. Uh, now we can print those and they can make the statue in, in much less time, much more accurate with much more detail um, than, uh, than they were able to before. So there, there are many applications where additive manufacturing, I would not have thought of art before I came to VoxelJet. And then it turns out art is uh, a huge piece of the market for us, probably 30% or so. So um, it's, it's quite an interesting thing. So just to talk about in general, the, the way the additive manufacturing world has been going, um, we, we've had growth uh, for the last 20 years. Uh, but it's really been through people looking at the existing capabilities. Now we've made improvements through those years, but really the existing capabilities, talking customers into figuring out how to apply it, trying it, them seeing advantages and them applying it a little bit more and a little bit more. Really geared in the prototype world or extremely low volume world. Uh, that's been up to this point. Now 
we're starting to transition into high volume. We've got new materials. We've got new capabilities. Customers are starting to recognize the technology. Um, so we're really starting to see customers move over to, to really applying it. Their engineers are starting to really understand the freedom. Uh, I was just at a diesel engine manufacturer talking to them last week and the engineers were talking about their mold limitations and we have negative walls that you have to do, drag line, drag things, uh, because of when you made it with a traditional tool, you couldn't have a positive wall because the tool couldn't come out. Well, now with printing, it's no problem. So the engineers are starting to see those opportunities that they're not restricted anymore. Um, and it's, uh, we're, we're really seeing a, a lot of uh, very smart applications that are opening up new windows for us and the customers to apply their products. So this is kind of where we see it going and really uh, jumping up, not only for us, but for the entire industry uh, of where it's going. So I think that that's all the, the prepared material I had. Uh, like I said, I didn't really cover all the details in there. Uh, we can make this available. I don't know if you normally do for these talks or not, uh, but uh, if anybody's interested in, in reading through anything, we can make this available. Um, but yeah, so that's, that's basically everything I thought I would cover today. I think uh, maybe uh, if there's any questions or anything, I can address that from, from our, what we're doing and, uh, and we'll go from there. Wonderful, thank you, Michael. Um, if anyone has questions, now is the time. Thank you, Michael. I have a, I have a sort of a technical question. I wasn't clear. Are the parts that you're making, let's say for the automotive industry, are those parts going right into vehicles or are they being used to create molds and then on for mass production? Yeah, so for automotive, primarily it's either the low volume older parts or prototype parts at the moment. And what we're doing is printing the molds or cores for the casting process, primarily on the automotive side. Um, we're just getting into the finished plastic pieces that are gonna be really installed in cars as end use products. Uh, but today, primarily it's been for the casting support. Uh, it's an interesting thing when you, you know, I didn't talk about this and I probably should have, but we don't do it. So I don't always think about it, but metal printing um, is a big thing in the, in the additive world. Uh, we have not chosen to go the medical pr metal, metal printing route. Um, there are a lot of restrictions with it. Uh, you're limited in size, material, all sorts of things uh, that can be really tricky. Uh, they're getting better at it every day, for sure. And I think we'll see it apply more and more. And there's certainly, like, like I said earlier, there's a place for every printer out there to be used. Um, you know, from the ones in the, if somebody's basement makes sense to up to a metal printer that's printing a metal piece, it makes sense. But um, the, the route that we have chosen is to support the thousands year old casting industry which is a, a, a metal structure and makeup that we've all known for thousands of years. Uh, so you still pour the same hot metal. We just give the freedom of design and flexibility through printing. Um, so that's kind of been the approach here. And that's what the automotive guys are using today. Um, they are metal printing sometimes too. Uh, generally, it's a fairly small part. Uh, generally, it's uh, a very low volume. Metal printing is still pretty expensive and pretty slow. Um, but, uh, you know, again, if you need a small part quickly, it, it's a great application. Uh, we just haven't went there because we're going more industrial volume, really going after it. But indirect parts is where we're focused in automotive at the moment. Thank you. Yep. Hey, Mike, I have, I have one for you. Um, what is the major advantage you see on your binder spray process versus the other processes out there, like an FDM and SLM or, you know, even a direct print off pellets? What is, what is uh, your system or the process that you use? What does that give, you know, users what other processes would not offer? Yep. 
so it's really speed and size are the two biggest ones. Uh, um, so we can print generally quite a bit faster than most of the processes you mentioned because we can make more scalable. So you can scale a, a printer up to be two meters long and print 50 parts in one layer if you want, all in one shot. Um, so it's very scalable, very fast. And then just scale in general, um, it's very difficult with an FDM printer to print a 15 foot long piece. Uh, with ours, it's really no problem because it's just scaling things up a little bit from where they were. Um, so th that's certainly the, the biggest advantage. Uh, we can hold tolerances generally quite a bit better than like an FDM printer. Uh, our surface is a lot smoother because we're building it up in a much thinner layer than the, than the FDM guys are typically are. Um, so there, there's a lot of differences. Um, the, uh, the interesting thing is, is we're not really worrying about competing with FDM. Uh, there's a place where it'll make sense and, they, and people should use it for that. What we're competing with and really breaking through is traditional methods. So injection molding, for example. Our new plastic printer is gonna go after injection molding. Um, not all of it, it's still gonna make sense to injection mold a lot of parts. We're gonna see millions of those all the time. But you know, we're gonna go take a little piece of that where injection molding is being used, but it's not necessarily giving them what they would really need. And we're gonna take that piece over to a printer and really give them what they need and the flexibility that they want. So it's a, it's a, it's, we're, like I said, we're at a really interesting time in the additive world. The technology is at the cusp of breaking over the traditional methods. And that's kind of what, what we see happening uh, right now. Um, Very good. Mike, Thank you. <laughs> Mike uh, Adam Hall's Band Forward Engineering. Great presentation. Thank you very much. Oh, yeah, thank you. Um, answered many of my questions, but holistically in general, what do you think are some of the key enablers? Uh, how can folks work together with Voxel Jet industry to, to realize that phenomenal growth potential? I, I don't want to say overcome barriers, but really what it comes down to, what are yeah. the things that are inhibiting you from realizing that growth? And how can we, uh, as a, a market, as an industry, work uh, with you? Yeah, so Ford uh, for sure does an exceptional job at that. You have your advanced manufacturing center where you're evaluating uh, all these processes all the time. And, quick, quick, uh, quick clarification, Mike. Sorry, forward, not Ford. Oh, F -O -R -D. oh, oh sorry. I thought you said Ford. Sorry. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Okay. All right. No worries. So, uh, engineering well, services provider. Good job. Ford does for sure. I don't know. But, yeah. Uh, <laughs> no <laughs> yeah, thanks. Um, yeah, so it's, it's really uh, understanding the, the, uh, the restrictions that aren't there anymore. You know, engineers have been designing to these restrictions of traditional methods since the beginning, right? I mean, since uh, they, they learned it from their senior engineers when they started and they've taught their junior engineers and it's passed down and down and down. And they were all true. They were all accurate and had to be there. Um, and, uh, and what we're doing, and part of our job, you know, I, I sell machines and I sell prints to people and all this, but a big part of my job is really educating um, the industries on what's available out there. Um, and, the, and we spend a, a lot of time on exactly that and, and letting folks know, hey, you don't have that restriction that you used to have. If you, if you can make a better design that performs better, like this cylinder head, with, uh, you know, with a 20% efficiency improvement uh, for uh, basically for free in the car, um, you know, those things are there. And I think getting folks to know that. So we do a, a ton of education on that. And uh, it's really every technical company um, has to take the initiative to, to learn the processes out there. And, you know, the, the guys like me are out there course willing to, to talk and show and experiment and give samples and let people work with it um, but it really does take initiative on the on the customer side of things uh, to get it done still you just can't make people do things and I think what we're seeing is some of the bigger guys like this German uh, automotive guy has figured it out and I think there's going to be a lot of other people following that um, I'm expecting for uh, several calls here as that news gets out more and more 
uh, from manufacturers here to say, hey, what are, what are we able to do here? Um, you know, that word of mouth of real application with real companies um, is, is a big deal. So, yeah, I think the, the interest in uh, new ways of doing things is the key from, from the customer side of what we can do. And then our job is to continue to, to promote, continue to talk to people and show them what, uh, uh, what's, what's possible. So what I'm hearing from that, Mike, is that you've got cost-effective ROI. It's not a it's not a technology batter, barrier. It's not a cost barrier. It's not a performance barrier. Uh, you've recently been demonstrating uh, exciting applications which support those um, claims, if you will. Yeah. Now it's a matter of uh, helping the engineering community, helping the industry understand what is possible. When they once they do that analysis, they say, "Oh, okay, I can." I, so picking the right applications, demonstrating it, and you have the case studies to support it. Yep, you got it. That's exactly right, and that's happening. You know, my, I went to Purdue, um, and their uh, their engineering school is putting a new foundry in. Uh, well, they were. I think COVID might have delayed it a little bit, but you know, one of the technologies they're putting in that foundry is a printer. Um, so we're going to have engineers learning from you know day one before they know what casting is uh how to how to do printing and, and those restrictions when they go to design something they're not even going to know what they are um so you know it's 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 going to grow up and continue to be there it's it's a it, like i said it's a cool time i'm in a i'm in a pretty fortunate job here i think uh and a fun time but but yeah really application is what we're getting down to and getting folks to understand what they can and should apply and again quick, quick follow up not every time it doesn't always make sense. I've been hogging your time. One quick follow-up question. You mentioned uh, um, the, the casting space uh, quite a bit. Uh, let's, mm -hmm. uh, let's talk about the polymer space, the plastic yep. space. Uh, what types of things are you doing? Who are you working with on the plastic side uh, to, yep. to deliver printed parts? Uh, and and I, I'm assuming this is uh, direct-to-vehicle printing uh, printed parts. Yep. Yeah, that, that's where we're heading right now. So that, that one, uh, we're just applying to our larger printer, which really uh, opens up that market for the automotive side, especially. But really, any there are so many markets that are interesting. You know, uh, a Volvo truck is interested in printing these things. I mean, you know, so many people are. And um, it's an interesting uh, process. A lot of folks look at their problem parts you know, like Volvo called us and said, man, I got these dashboard parts from this trucks, these trucks that haven't been made in 30 years and the tools are thrown away. And, you know, it's a story that the manufacturing world knows all too well. And uh, they were like, what can we do? And we're like, well, send us a model and we'll print them for you. I mean, that's an option to get them. And uh, you can have them like in three days. Uh, kind of success thing. story, Mike, uh, were you able to deliver parts that met their performance and validation yeah. requirements? Yep. Yep. For sure. Yeah. Yeah. So, and that's exactly what's happening in that polymer world is we're putting new materials out there. So we started off uh, the, the easiest material to 3d print is a nylon PA 12. Um, and we're graduating into polypropylenes and TPUs and PIBAs and all these other materials. I'm not a material expert, so that's about as far as I can go, but um uh, we're graduating into all those materials that apply and meet all those requirements that are needed for the different components that are there. Um, uh, polypropylene is a really popular automotive uh, piece because it's cheaper and, and uh, well known and all that good stuff. So, um, so as we've applied those materials and we're combining it up with the larger printer, the automotive companies are saying, whoa, we can really do a lot of things with this. We can make low run production. We can make uh, prototype components to build things up uh, completely before we even spend a dollar on a permanent tool or anything else. Um, and then, as I as I showed in the one example there, you know, we're going to put cells of these in that are going to show that you can make half a million, a million of these things a year, and it's going to pop out the end out of an automated cell. And that that's where it's really going to, I think, take the automotive world. Uh, and turn it upside down a little bit when we get there. Um, Thanks, Mike. Yep, Thanks, absolutely. Thank you. Mike, I got a question. Jules, if I may, uh, 
I would have I would have raised my hand, but the only thing that I can do with the Zoom version I have here is I can throw you know some smileys at you. So I don't want to do that. So I'm jumping yeah. in. I still don't figure it out. We'll make an exception. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks, Charles. <laughs> my quick question. I found it very interesting when you were mentioning your reaching out to the engineering uh, people and all of them, uh, you know, and 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 telling them or or introducing them to this new technology. Have you ever thought about you know taking this a little step further? You mentioned Purdue, but what I was thinking, like, you know, reaching the kids before they go into engineering degrees so that their minds are not going to be spoiled, you know, when they're at college or at university by faculty who is, yeah. all the good, for all the right reasons, you know, I'm not judging, uh, <laughs> limited yeah. to their knowledge as well. So just curious uh, if, if, if you are, you know, looking into that as well and getting the ideas out as soon as possible. Yeah, so a little bit. Um, you know, we are a small group, so it's difficult to get to everything. Uh, we for sure participate in like manufacturing days where we're getting the younger, technically interested kids involved. I'm touring them through. We tour groups through here, show them the technology, talk about things. That really doesn't make sense to them yet, I don't think, uh, because they just, you know, I mean, casting is a is a crazy thing, right? But uh, but but they they see at least the technology there. Um, the universities are getting better and better about avoiding that bias for sure. But uh, to your exact point, we had this discussion recently here. You know, Germany is uh, is very good, and, and the U.S. used to be better at it at vocational schools. I think is what we call them, and it was really a technical training rather than a college or university. And and I think Germany's really pretty good at that still, from everything I've seen. The U.S. does it some still, but yeah. not as much as as it used to be. It used to be very prominent. And then it yeah. got this negative annotation where, yeah. oh, if you're going to vocational school, you're not a smart kid, you know, or whatever. <laughs> and it's not that at all. It's that they're interested in hands on and, and doing things rather than drawing and talking and being on a computer, you know. So it's it's a, an interesting thing. But that vocational uh, uh, losing where we drop that that stuff. I think we really miss some of that opportunity that Germany really is ahead of us on in that regard for sure. I'm so happy that you mentioned that. And Mike, uh, we need to talk definitely because you might not necessarily be aware, but actually what we're doing is we're running such programs here in the United States already, pretty successful, yeah. especially also in Michigan, because there's a lot of different companies that say, you know, uh, <clears throat> I need to do something here. So, and, and this is why we cooperate with lots of colleges, you know, because the school part is taken over by colleges. And I know that the biggest complaints of the companies always is, you know, qualification of faculty or, you know, <clears throat> uh, colleges, you know, what do they teach? Where is their mindset in terms of, you know, that's our curriculum. We've done it all the time this way. Mm -hmm. So there is no space for new ideas, but that's not what the yeah. companies are looking for, especially when it comes to your technology. Awesome, thank yeah. you so much. And let's stay in touch. I'm definitely Perfect. gonna go yeah, perfect, sounds perfect, good. perfect candidate for the apprenticeship program. Yeah, yeah, I think it would make sense. Yeah. Um, yeah, I'll have a last one for you, Mike. Um, on the material side, touching a little bit. So, where, where, where is your material science and your material know-how coming along? As far as I understand, you probably your machines run with your materials and not with every powder that is out in that world right mm -hmm. it's a it's a yeah. material machine combination that has to match and um so the question will be where are you getting your polymer know-how your material science mm -hmm. know-how uh in who you're working with in order to expand you were talking about new materials can you run carbon fiber materials who you work with yeah. when it comes to those kind of specialty materials or high performance polymers can can you just you know outline real quick on yeah. Um, how are you handling this? Thank you. Yeah, you, you must be somewhere near this industry because that's a terrific <laughs> question and it's very tricky. <laughs> um, yeah. So um, our approach is a little different. So one of our big competitors in the polymer side of things is HP, right? So okay. we're really going after like injection molding type markets and things like that. But if you look at machine co competition, it's HP is doing a similar process to what we do. We think ours is better, of course, but um but we're both both doing similar printing. So our approach is our printers are open. Uh, we intend on material companies like 
Ivonic or BASF or whoever out there. There's a new guy called Jabil that's doing a lot of this stuff. Um, we, um, our printers are open for them to develop their materials. Um, so there's two methods, right? You can develop it all yourself, control it, force your customers to buy your material and run your printer. Um, customers get very unhappy with that. Uh, they don't like you controlling them, uh, especially the big customers. They really don't like you controlling them. And, uh, and that's not always the best. So, so customers can be happier if we let them do it. However, a lot of them say they wanna do it, but don't wanna do it. They want you to do it for them anyway, right? Um, but we really have just too many masters to serve to develop every material that everybody wants. It, it would be impossible. Uh, we would have, I don't know, probably 50 people qualifying material 24 hours a day, it would be crazy. So what our approach has been is, hey, let's open the machine up, let's let the material experts develop their materials on our printers, and then we're gonna sell printers still, and they'll sell their material and we'll all be happy. And, um, and so that's what we're doing. So we certainly have a base of, uh, of expertise in, within our facility. Uh, you know, we're, we qualified PA-12 completely. Um, so we have that nylon qualified. Uh, TPU's next, it'll be fully qualified, but it's a TPU, right? There's probably 50 TPUs out there that you could print. We're qualifying this one. Will all of them work exactly the same? Probably not. Um, some will need a little more heat, a little less heat, you know, different things going on uh, to work. And so that's where we're pushing that small printer I showed in this one slide um, to, the, to the material people and saying, here, take this printer, develop your stuff on it, and then we will be glad to say, hey, you know, Ivonic has a TPU that is qualified and running on our printer. And then the customers, if that's the TPU they want, they get. Um, but, uh, and we, we've been successful with that. We have uh, several material suppliers now working towards that. We started off where we were trying to do it all and you just couldn't keep up. You know, it, it was just impossible and, and people would pay you to do the work. It's, it was just impossible to, to do it. It wasn't about uh, cost even, it was just, just resource in general. Um, yeah, so our approach is a little different on that regard, maybe than HP. I don't know if you work with MJFs at all. Um, I was guessing with that question, maybe you have, but uh, uh, they are controlling it much more. Uh, we are leaving it open and saying, hey, customer. And, and by the way, the bigger companies have material research departments that do their own research, not even just a material supplier. And, uh, and they'll have these printers and work on it too. So it's really the, the full spectrum. We do the initial setup, we get them running, we tell them what's possible. And then if they have specific needs for their specific material that they want to control and not share also, uh, they can do that. Uh, okay. Yeah. So it's a little Very different good. approach maybe than a lot of the printer world is. A lot of the printer world wants to sell the consumable for sure. And it, it, it just gets to be too much on this in the polymer side. Okay. Very good. Thank you. Yep. Yeah. Uh, Michael, I also have a question. Um, I see in your slides that uh, your co-business is also in architecture and art. Mm -hmm. um, knowing that the construction industry is a very wasteful industry and also an industry where there's a lot of potential still for lightweight solutions. What kind of mm -hmm. potential do you see for this specific sector and what does VoxelJet do in there? Yeah, that's a, that's a good one. So uh, uh, concrete forming is one of the big applications. It's a, it's a pretty interesting, I don't have anything in my slides here today, but you know, uh, you'll get a uh, museum who wants to do a very unique design in a, in a concrete ceiling, let's say for a room. Uh, we'll print the form for them to make that. They pour the concrete on it and, uh, and then they install the ceiling in with this whatever design they wanted in forming. So, that's one of the applications today that's pretty common. Um, we've printed uh, uh, molds for a concrete kitchen, actually. Uh, they did an ultra lightweight concrete where they poured it into forms and made literally cabinet doors and the cabinet base and everything out of a, a lightweight concrete. Um, so, so there's a lot of, uh, of making forms for concrete today. Uh, and that's, probably our best fit at the moment. 
there is an interesting thing out that's not VoxelJet, um, which is a, a, a printer company called Forest. It's F-O-R-U-S-T. And they are actually printing wood. Uh, they're doing it with like a wood powder. And so when you have the architectural designs for wood, you know, it's environmentally friendly because it's all like sawdust they use to make it and all this good stuff. And they can actually print very unique designs of wood that it comes out literally like a piece of wood. You can paint, finish, stain, do whatever you want to do. I don't know how the stain works, by the way. I haven't done it, but I've seen the videos. It looks pretty cool. Um, so, you know, it's, it's definitely going to apply there. I think probably all of us have seen the videos where there's a, a concrete uh, arm with a robot moving around, you know, building a house uh, with walls and all that good stuff. And, and, you know, I think that probably has its application. Um, that's not our thing for sure. Uh, there'll be other people out there doing it, but, uh, but I think it's going to be more in the, um, the upfront side as we move forward of producing things that will be used in the construction side is probably more where it'll go in the future. Um, you know, making forms today, you know, we've made some pretty cool staircases with the company where they wanted concrete stairs going up that were spiral and funky designs and all that good stuff. So, you know, a lot of that stuff is there, but that's a fairly unique high-end application. I think as the, as the material side develops and they're not, probably not us, but the industry in general is printing more construction material is where that'll, that'll come in more. Awesome. Sounds very interesting. Um, Michael, can, I'm sorry, ahead. Jules. Uh, Michael, can I ask one more question? Um, yeah, sure. With regard to, you talk about all the, the physical applications and, and teaching people and stuff. Can you talk a little bit about the, the software that's behind it? Is that something that VoxelJet owns and, and customizes? Is it open source? How do you get people up and running with this stuff? So we do a little bit of both, uh, for sure. Uh, our printers primarily run on a platform called Atlas, which is the, the software that runs it. Uh, it's a common, common software. It's, it's not necessarily proprietary or anything. Um, and then, uh, so there's really two pieces of it. There's the operating the machine software, and then there's a controlling the, what you're printing software, where it slices it and creates the pieces that are gonna print out as it goes. And uh, for us, that's primarily uh, Rapix is what we use. I think it's the most common 3D printing slicing software, at least in the industrial world, um, uh, for that. So we use both of those as our base softwares. Um, the, uh, the newer uh, processes that we've come out with, we've actually uh, a version of Rapix called ProPrint is what we're using. And it's customized with us. But what it really does is the way we run it, it's open to customers. So you can pull data, you can run macros and change processes. Um, it's, it's really allowing that material on that, the, the question earlier on the polymers and how we're gonna let other people develop material too. Um, that software is key because that gives that uh, customer that's running that machine the ability to adjust and run whatever they want. If they want to run it faster, slower, thicker, thinner, hotter, colder, whatever it needs to be for their material, they're, we're open. They're able to do that with ours. And that's a unique, uh, that's one of our, our USPs we like to talk about um, for VoxelJet is the ability to do that. Um, so yeah, there is kind of standard softwares that the 3D printing world I think is used and, and those companies have really gotten pretty good at it. Uh, but we're also adapting it to our processes and, and making it more open to where a customer can do more than they have typically done in the past. Now, in a normal applica ap application, because you talked about how hard is it to get them up and running as another part of that. So normally, um, when a customer buys one of our printers, uh, a lot of times they'll have one of their operators come here or two of them to our facility. They spend a day with our guys out here running a couple machines um, and then they go home. And usually within a week or two, we're installing the machine there. Uh, most of our machines we move there, we have it running within two or three days and we spend two or three days training them. And when we're done with that week, 
the customer runs that machine. They still have questions, of course. They get hung up, they forget something, whatever, that all happens. But in general, after three days of training, a customer can run a printer um, uh, at, at its basic level, right? They're not gonna be experts in, in tweaking settings in the machine or anything like that at that point, but to just operate it as a printer, it's usually just a few days. It's pretty straightforward software, um, nothing too crazy. Uh, you know, and I think it's similar experience on like the it's small FDM printers, you know, at home, when you get them, you kind of plug them in and you can use them, you know, it's not, uh, not too hard to do. And I, all the printers kind of work that way. Um, there's not too many tricks to it. Thank you, Michael. Yep. Any further questions? I have a feeling we've got a lot of questions. <laughs> So if you have any more questions um, after the event, uh, Michael has his contact information in sure. the presentation. Um, so we will be able to distribute that. Um, and otherwise I would also like to make you aware of our next Illinois business luncheon happening on June 2nd about returning to the workplace. What kind of uh, regulations and things do you need consider to consider presented by Barnes and Thornburg? So if you're interested in uh, learning more, please register. Um, and otherwise I would like to thank you everyone for attending the event, uh, for VoxelJet for presenting, for Rödel for sponsoring. Thank you very much, we really appreciate it. Um, and if you have any more questions regarding your membership, um, Robert and I are always happy to help. So thank you very All much right. for your attendance and enjoy the rest of your day. All right. Thanks thank everybody. You, everybody. Thank, thank you. you. Good day. Bye. -bye. Thanks. Thank you. Bye.